Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Kane. Uh, as you know, we, uh, we're in the board of directors. We're having a uh, revolving presidency, and I'm the president for April. Glad to be with you. Uh, glad to be here, and we have great presentation for you tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody who puts these Zooms together, and it's not so easy, and, uh, and uh, we have a great team that's doing it. Also, we're all looking forward to going back to live meetings. We hope in September we're working on it. We want to see everybody. It's great to have the collegial uh, atmosphere at the, uh, the in-person meetings. So we're hanging on with our Zoom meetings. We're keeping up our interest, but we want to get back to those live meetings too. One, I once read that communication is 80% nonverbal. And so when you get there and you, and you see the reaction of other people, when you hear the hear their speakers and see their, it's a whole, the whole presentation. It's always uh, a great thing to do. And I know when I go in those meetings, I, I find interesting people and I enjoy being there and out and uh, people who care about the Civil War. So we're looking forward to getting back to those, uh, those meetings very really soon. We have a couple of things to share with you before we get started. So can we have the first slide? There we go. Uh, you guys, uh, the welcome, welcome to our presentation tonight, and uh, let's look at the second slide. All right, so here we have our contact information, and I want you particularly to pay attention to the Gmail address. It wasn't that long ago, maybe in the last couple of months, that we, we settled on this uh, email address. That's it, Brunswick there, and so make a note of it if you've uh, had some any kind of communication problem with us. Uh, make a note of it and let us know. Also, if you have feedback about the presentation and you want to let us know either about the presentation itself or the technical issues, send us a, an email there and we really want to hear how it's going. So can we have the next slide? All right, here's, you, to stay in touch with us, it's, it's, uh, we've tried every single way. We reached out for everything. You can see them right here that uh, we have we have our website, we have our Facebook page, we have our YouTube page. Uh, I'm not the, uh, the youngest guy, I don't know all the different technologies, but I know that I can go on YouTube and, uh, and I can check out all the things we have there. Uh, and, and I urge you to remember that if you, uh, if you have to leave the meeting early, come back in a time in the future and, and check out the meeting on our YouTube channel. So let's have the next slide. Oh, oh, this is really important. Uh, in order to, for us to get uh, the strongest possible presentation over Zoom, I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to go on your, on your screen there and, and touch the stop video icon. This will improve the quality of the Zoom. If it's too hard for you, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it from our end. But if you could now go down and hit that, it would be really helpful. And then um, on the chat icon, uh, address a question, any questions you have to everyone. And that question will have it, will save it, and will be ready for questions at the end of the presentation. Sometimes the questions are great and I, I look forward to them uh, all the time. So I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm sure our presentation will, um, will challenge you to come up with uh, some great questions. So uh, now, oh, let me tell you, here we have, Tonight, we have a great speaker. We have Brian Wills here tonight, and uh, you see a slide on him here. But let me give you the full story on Brian, because he is, he's, got, he's got such great credentials. He's the director of the Center for Study of Civil War era at Kennesaw State University in Kennesaw, Georgia, where he's the professor of history. He's a tour guide, a speaker, a preservationist, and he's done everything. He's a member of the Civil War Commission in Georgia, and he's the past president of the Atlanta Civil War Roundtable. So he's a roundtable guy. He's an award-winning author of numerous works relating to the Civil War, including biographies of Nathan Bedford Forrest. I gotta get that one. Uh, William Dorsey Pender and George Thomas. He's the recipient of the 2018 Richard Boxdale Harwell Award for the best book on the Civil War topic for 2017 by the Atlanta Civil War Roundtable. In 2000, he received the Outstanding Faculty Award from the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I'm telling you, that means he not only knows his stuff, but he's a good teacher. He got the Charles L. Dufour Award for the Civil War Roundtable in New Orleans. And he's just gonna give us a, a, a just a great presentation here tonight. Uh, I can't wait 
to learn more about General Thomas, the man, and here's the man who knows everything about General Thomas, Brian Wills himself. Let me, uh, let me unmute myself and then do my screen share and then we'll be good to go. And I think this is, now we're we'll hit that again and see if we're, how we're doing, there we go. Um, I'm so glad to be here again with you. I know I uh, saw Wally earlier. It's great to see Wally and uh, I've been to uh, the round table before, but it's been at, at different stages. And uh, now we actually have a place in Holden Beach, so I'm not that far away. So uh, hopefully I can get down for uh, some meetings, even if I'm not the speaker, uh, if, I, if we get down to the, to the beach in time and the right, uh, right time and location. Uh, but we're excited to be here. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of the Civil War Era. We have to make it short to Civil War Center. And, um, and uh, we're kind of like everybody else. We're in virtual world for right now. But we do have programming that take, takes place. And uh, once we get back, I think we may have our collectors showcase in August live. We'll probably have a, a shortened version. And then after that, we'll start having hopefully our in-person programs as well. And uh, we had Mike last year and he did a wonderful job at our symposium just before everything shut down and it wasn't his fault. It just is the way that the, the uh, pandemic did it for all of us. Uh, there's a picture of George Thomas and it's kind of got a hard look and you may understand more about why he has such a hard look on that cover of the book. Uh, but it actually comes from a quote from uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, he said, uh, Thomas may be slow, but he's as true as steel. And so I didn't pick he may be slow as the subtitle I picked he as true as steel. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So with that, let's just go ahead and get in. One of the things that uh, Thomas will get is, is numerous nicknames. And among others, the, probably the more famous one would include uh, Old Slow Trot. And so I try to pick various images from his life, either depictions of him by sketch artists or print uh, masters or actual photographs and uh, a signature there for old slow trot. And that name comes uh, from when he was an instructor at West Point where he tried to get his charges while he was teaching cavalry in an inside arena in an enclosed building uh, to slow down because of course, if they collided with columns that tended to not work out so well. So everyone uh, picked up the old slow trot from hearing him give that command uh, as a way of getting people to get to slow down and get under control in an enclosed environment. Uh, but of course, he was also methodical and, and slow in his, uh, in his presentations in, in person, but also in his uh, waging of war. And I think that's for another reason that that, that, that nickname stuck. Uh, his roots are in Southampton County. I was actually raised in Nansman County, which no longer exists. I guess that probably tells you something about what they think of my county, but uh, it's uh, the neighboring county of Southampton County. And today it's the city of Suffolk. So it merged with Suffolk and it's the third area wise largest city in the world, uh, but it's still got uh, cows and, and farms and other things in various parts of it, but increasingly it's growing housing, it grows houses. But in Southampton County, not too far from uh, what is today Cortland, Virginia, but back in the day was Jerusalem. Uh, uh, Thomas was born in a home that still stands. It's called Thomaston. I took a couple of images from some of the markers in the area. Uh, and it is in private hands. So if you did go, you would wanna be respectful and, uh, and people there are very nice. We actually took a tour there once and got the bus stop uh, stuck in a mud hole and the um, neighboring uh, farmer had to come with his tractor and pull us out. Uh, but if you will see the obelisk kind of uh, on the top part of that picture, uh, that is not where Thomas himself is buried. He's actually buried somewhere else. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, that is the marker for a number of the family members uh, so Thomas's roots are deep in uh, Southampton County, Virginia. Uh, if you're not originally from the region or you haven't been in this area that long, um, the uh, Southampton County, of course, borders on the, the border of North Carolina. Um, he was born on July 31st, 1816. So you can see 
he was a little older as a cadet at uh, West Point, of course, as, a, uh, as he goes forward uh, from uh, West Point into his career. He's a little more mature in his, uh, in his life and in his approach and uh, a little more serious. A lot of people likened him, even at an earlier age, to George Washington simply because he was seemingly so serious. I have this uh, couple of collections of pictures and images from Mexico. Thomas will see action in a number of locations in the old army. Uh, he will spend some time in Florida in one of the Seminole Wars. Uh, he'll be stationed in a, quite a number of places as it turns out, both in more traditional sort of settings that uh, are established and some, some of the newer settings that are being carved out. Uh, and here uh, he is uh, in action in two places in Monterey and in Buena Vista. If you're from Virginia, they say Buena Vista, but it's Buena Vista. At any rate, um, in the street fighting at Monterey, he learned that style of fighting. Uh, commanding an artillery piece that uh, he had to literally um, fight through the streets to try to get it in position to serve. And then uh, and the plains and uh, ravines and, and, and more of an open setting in terms of uh, there was no town or no st city structures at Buena Vista, he was there as well. And those were the two primary uh, places that he served in the, uh, the Mexican-American War. He was also at what became Fort Brown and then Brownsville, Texas, but just prior to going into Mexico itself. And one of the stories I think that shows you a little bit about his character and his personality uh, is connected to those ornamental elements at the bottom. Uh, his neighbors in Southampton County wanted to give him something to recognize his bravery and his courage. He had, get, he had gotten actually two brevet promotions and uh, so there were other ways that uh, his service garnered attention, but they wanted to give him something that would, would be very nice, was carved on and, and, and looked very uh, stylish. And he was happy to accept that with the exception that he did not want to give a speech when he came to, to obtain the item. So uh, the ceremonial uh, sword is one thing, that's fine, but if you are going to have to give a speech to get it, that's a whole nother ball of wax. He was not that kind of person that he felt the great desire to uh, put himself on a public platform to promote himself. They said at West Point when he would do recitations at the board that, uh, that he would uh, very clearly show his distress at doing anything in public. But uh, one of the comments that's made about him being slow, he will play off of uh, this service that he has in uh, Mexico. He said, I saved my section of Bragg's battery at Buena Vista by being a little slow. In other words, hard to drive from the, from the spot, from the location in which he was holding up. So he was in, uh, in Florida, he was in Mexico, he'll go out to California, he'll be at, uh, at various points on the East Coast. He sees a lot of service in the old army. But right before the war, he's actually in Texas, and it's in Texas where he serves with uh, Robert E. Lee on a number of courts martial, and uh, he's at various posts throughout Texas. And again, I think it gives a sort of an indication of his personality when he makes the comment that um, he is going to actually make during the Civil War to one of his uh, comrades there, but he's remembering back to his experiences in the old army when he had actually at one time been a commander of a post and also uh, had almost every other duty associated with that post. It was a rather small uh, post and responsibility, but he had everything from commissary and, and everything to a commander. And he had gone away for a brief period of time and things had not gone well. And he learned a lesson from that that he was sharing later on in, in the Civil War. He said, I cannot leave because he was certain that if he did, things would go uh, awry. Things would not go right. And one thing that Thomas wanted to do was to make sure that he, as much as possible, uh, had some sense of control over himself, over his comrades, and over what was happening around him. So Thomas was one of these individuals that didn't want to delegate responsibilities that he thought 
uh, were, were, should accrue to him and to him alone. Uh, at the bottom, I've put a train because I wanted to make sure I remembered to tell the story of what happens to him just prior to the American Civil War. He's in Texas with, with uh, as I mentioned, Robert E. Lee and actually uh, uh, ends up bringing his wife out for a brief period of time, which is not going to be what he will do in the Civil War itself. In the Civil War, uh, she will not be in his presence. He will not be in her presence for a considerable length of time, and we'll see a story that relates to that. Uh, both of them were older when they married. Uh, they met at West Point, but not in his initial time there. Uh, but when he came back as an instructor, and one of his uh, time, part of his time was under uh, Robert E. Lee as superintendent at, at West Point. But what will happen is um, he's on his way back to the east when uh, things are beginning to uh, break on the coast and, and uh, the hostilities or imminent possibility of hostilities is, is, uh, is there. And he's actually on his way back on a train when he stops uh, at night to stretch his legs and he gets off the, the train, steps off of what he thinks is onto solid ground, only to find that it's a ditch and a very deep ditch. And he falls down the length of it and wrenches his back. And it's actually for that injury that he is laid up at the time uh, when the war breaks out. And it appears as if his period of active uh, military service will probably be over. So he's actually exploring a number of other things to do uh, because he's laid up from this back injury. And if he was already had a tendency to be slow, you can imagine how that would exacerbate the situation. So one of the problems for Thomas is that he's gonna have to, con to even consider whether he is capable of active service and, and slowly recovery uh, occurs and he is gonna be able to, to return to active service after all. But if he was old slow trot, uh, this doesn't make that any less likely that that will be the case. Of course, the war itself then changes his life and his life's trajectory is his journey in the old army uh, as he is a Virginian, a native of uh, Virginia, and yet uh, has to make choices about what to do when Virginia also has to make a choice. And Virginia, as most of you will know, did not make its choice in the initial uh, outburst of, of secession, but in the second wave after the firing of on Fort Sumter and the calling out of 75,000 volunteers by um, President Lincoln. So the question of which loyalty, will he have the same call to duty that Robert E. Lee felt to Virginia, to the flag of Virginia, to the capital there of Virginia? Will he have it to the unfinished dome in Washington, to the Union Eagle, uh, and uh, which way will it go? Thomas is interesting because, of course, his family was so Southern, very devoted to the Southern cause. And uh, there were a lot of people who felt that Thomas himself would probably go in that way. And yet he married a woman from Troy, New York. And that woman uh, was kind of like all people. She had an influence on him. But she will say that she did not think the general ever did anything that he would not have done himself. In other words, that she didn't have to convince him of any uh, duty that he should follow. He would know the proper course to take. He would know his duty. And I actually originally thought about calling my book Duty's Soldier because he certainly was um, aware of his, uh, what he felt was his oath, aware of his duty to the old army and to the Union, and he will remain that way. Uh, if I can remember it, you never know whether you'll remember things if you say something at one point. Uh, his comment about what happens after the war when he is on one of his last tours of duty to the far Northwest and to a new territory uh, that uh, the United States has just acquired. And he has a special feeling about what uh, that area would represent if it had been available for the hotheads of uh, the secession crisis. He was, he was not an extremist. He didn't care for extremists. And so he will articulate that in a funny way later. We'll try to remember. If I don't, you can ask me on the chat. I put this, uh, this slide's a little out of order chronologically in a sense because it's really tying to something that um, Abraham Lincoln will say during the course of the uh, Kentucky campaign. 
uh, when Braxton Bragg and Edmund Kirby Smith move into Kentucky and then Don Carlos Buell has to figure out how to uh, stop that and he doesn't act in the way that the government is that appreciative of and they talk about removing him and actually turn to Thomas who says at that point that he feels like it's not fair to him or to the country or to anyone else for him to take a role mid campaign in a campaign he didn't plan with an army that he didn't prepare. And so he will decline. And so when uh, Buell gets replaced subsequently by William Stark Rosecrans, uh, the comment is made, well, would you consider Thomas at this point? And the comment is let the Virginian wait. But the reason I put that here is that Grant, Thomas, and, and Grant, Sherman, and uh, Lincoln are just some of the ones who are trying to determine just how loyal and enthusiastic uh, the Virginian is for the Union cause. And I would say it was really more a question in most people's minds of enthusiasm rather than loyalty. I don't think most people thought there was a question of loyalty, uh, but I do think they thought, will he truly put his heart and soul into this conflict into this situation. And Sherman supposedly at one point had asked Thomas very early in the war what he was doing and he said, I'm going south. And Sherman reacted as he claimed in his memoirs uh, with uh, uh, taken aback by this comment and Thomas said, no, I'm going at the head of my troops. So the feeling was that uh, uh, at any point, uh, does Thomas have to prove himself uh, at least to a certain point or a certain level before people will turn to him as a uh, w without questioning or without concern about his dedication to the cause. Mill Springs is one of those smaller engagements. It's nevertheless an important engagement uh, early in the war for um, George Thomas and for the Union in the Western. Again, those of you who know the war well know the East, the West, and the Trans Mississippi, with the West being. Um, everything east of the Mississippi River, but west of the Appalachians. And so uh, Kentucky and, and uh, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, uh, substantial parts, of course, of Louisiana, Mississippi, all of those would be part of the Western theater. And uh, in the case of Kentucky, of course, Kentucky had started neutral and then uh, uh, because uh, the good Bishop Polk moved uh, to put troops on in Columbus, Miss, uh, Columbus, Kentucky, uh, the neutrality kind of went away and Grant very quickly crossed and others crossed as well into Kentucky and, and began to openly uh, move into Kentucky in ways that, that were already operations in Kentucky. They were just kind of under wraps or at least qu being quietly done. But the fighting at Mill Springs came from the desire to do something to bring pressure on uh, the Confederates who controlled East Tennessee. East Tennessee was largely Unionist, and the idea was that these Unionists had the foot of the Confederacy on, the, on their throats, and that the Union should move uh, somehow in such a way as to relieve that pressure. And so moving out of the bluegrass territory into um, uh, the area much closer to the uh, border of Tennessee, uh, the um, Battle of Mill Springs or Logan's Crossroads will take place in January 1862. Uh, there was a commander by the name of Albin Sheff who was supposed to meet up with George Thomas. And the idea here would be if the Confederates could strike first, they could hit Thomas before those reinforcements could arrive, before the, that uh, junction could take place. And the immediate commander of these troops was Felix Zollicoff, a, a newspaper editor from uh, Tennessee, who was um, a real fire eater and uh, real aggressive. He had already had a fight, in fact, with Alvin Sheff at a place called Wildcat Mountain. And Zollicoffer has a, a base camp that's right along the rain-swollen Cumberland River, and uh, yet he wants to march out from that base camp. It's got some entrenchments. It's got a pretty good defensive position, except that it's got a swollen river at its back. Uh, but it's uh, certainly he could hold out there, or at least he would think he could hold out, but holding out is not in his mind. He wants to advance, he wants to attack, and he wants to attack Thomas before Thomas and Chef can, can unite. So he moves up. Unfortunately, it's a rainy day. It's very um, uh, drizzly and, and, and misty rain for most of the day. 
the Confederates largely have a flintlock rifle still, so those are, make it problematic for keeping your powder dry under those conditions. And so it's a very difficult advance and a difficult fight. Uh, Thomas and his men feed troops in uh, and begin to, to get a handle on that battle when, the, um, when Zollicoff arrives inadvertently into Union lines. And when he approaches troops, he sees them firing at his men and he orders them to stop firing. Well, he is a Confederate general and you would assume that Union soldiers would not listen to him, but he's wearing a rain, he's wearing rain gear and uh, it's covering his uniform. And it's also, of course, he's behaving and sounding and acting like an officer. Do not fire into your friends and that sort of friendly fire kind of uh, warning. And so the federal stop, and then one of the aides comes up and not so quietly informs Zollicoffer that those are the enemy, and then shoots at the horse of one of the Union officers. Union officer is from Lexington, Kentucky. You know, they love basketball, but they also love horses. And when he has his horse shot out from under him, he is not a happy camper. And so he will fire back at Zollicoffer and then his men will fire at uh, Zollicoffer and Zollicoffer, the aide and one other man are shot down in the, um, in the roadway. And, uh, and the leadership, at least on the, on the field itself is, uh, is of course compromised. But it's as much because of a bayonet attack and because the uh, Confederate forces run low of ammunition and not so much because of Zollicoffer's death, the Confederates began to retreat back to their uh, base camp at Beach Grove. When they get finally back to that point, there's not um, uh, anywhere else for them to go theoretically. And it's taken all day from the beginning of the fight to this point. And Thomas's troops have pursued firing and fighting all the way. And again, those of you who study the war will know that troops that retreat or are defeated are in usually not very good shape but troops that advance and attack are not in much better shape. And so Thomas's troops have suffered losses. They've had, um, they've had unit breakdowns of the cohesion of those units. And so there's a lot of reasons why things don't look like they're all that good as, uh, as Thomas's troops begin to approach the Confederate positions. Um, Thomas takes that into account and begins to try to take dispositions to set his men into place, assuming that the next day the enemy will be there trapped in the, in the fortifications and the earthworks, and he can finish them off. During the night, you see a panel for it, a little side wheel steamer takes the men in sort of mini Dunkirk style across the river, at least the vast majority of them, where they disappear, where they break up, the army breaks up but they escape. And the next morning when uh, Thomas is ready to start the attack that will finish this off and theoretically get a surrender from the Confederates or finish them off in another way, uh, there's nothing to finish off. The Confederates are for the most part gone. Uh, Fry, the same officer who had had his horse killed and then was the one who shot uh, at Zollicoffer, uh, complained to Thomas, why didn't you finish him off last night? And another thing I've admired about Thomas is he had uh, plenty of reasons to explain why he did what he did. But he looked at Fry and very honestly said, hang it, Fry, I never once thought of it. It just didn't enter his mind to finish them off. And had he done so, he might have been unconditional surrender Thomas instead of February unconditional surrender grant at, at uh, Fort Donaldson. I put this one slide in only because I want to show that not everything is all that clear for a lot of things, including the behavior of George Thomas, but the way that people assume or assess his behavior. Um, Henry Halleck will take over after uh, the um, shock of Shiloh and uh, Grant kind of gets shuttled on the back burner, you might say, uh, kind of moved into a secondary position where it looks like he might actually be put on the shelf. And then Halleck starts a very slow and methodical movement towards Corinth, Mississippi, or if you're from that area, you say Corinth. And uh, one of the people that had been advanced under Halleck at the uh, expense Grant was George Thomas. So a lot of people have the assumption that it's Grant and 
and uh, Thomas and what happens to them in the aftermath of Shiloh that, that causes friction between the two of them. And that does not appear to me to have been the case. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more later on. But that is the supposed point at which uh, Grant and, and Thomas have their sort of initial falling out. Thomas never expresses a public um, dislike or anything else for, uh, for, Tom, for uh, Grant or for Sherman for that matter. And you talk about a friend. Sherman and, and Thomas really were friends and they were roommates at, in West Point. Uh, so they had connections, but and they'd been together in, in other posts. But Thomas never seemed to do anything that Sherman and both look at it as either as both good and bad at the same time. And I didn't say this one good thing about Thomas. He had to sort of say both. And if you remember, I told you my book was he may be slow, but he's as true as steel. Uh, one of the other points, though, that I do think is worth remembering is that for Thomas's career, he has tremendous success, and he's going to do very well most of the time. But this does not mean that he always performed flawlessly or that he always performed well at Perryville. He will be in um, a position where he could have supported uh, the Union forces under Don Carlos Buell and does not do as good a job there, in part because of, as again, those of you who might study the war know the phenomenon of acoustic shadow, uh, the notion that the atmospherics work in such a way that even if you're relatively close to an engagement, you may not fully understand or appreciate the nature of that engagement, even if people in another uh, direction because of wind and, and atmospherics might hear it from many miles away. And so again, Thomas is, is, you know, some people say he sulked or he wasn't, you know, he wasn't behaving the way he should have behaved as an officer uh, in support of the larger picture. But it's really, uh, I think, more of a circumstantial situation than it is personality or any kind of problem in that respect. But again, keep in mind that Buell has made, uh, has run afoul of the leadership in Washington and they've at least thought about Thomas as a potential uh, replacement only to have Thomas turn it down. And then when it goes to Rosecrans, who Thomas believes is his junior, and actually uh, the argument will be made that he's not, but that's a convenient argument more than it is a reality of the way it was, uh, Thomas will back down and he will end up uh, accepting uh, what he uh, his role will be going forward, and he likes Rosecrans. He and Rosecrans get along, and he uh, they wage war in a very similar fashion, and so uh, he is not uh, anti Rosecrans. But Halleck uh, will tell him, you know, when you turned it down, once that opportunity became available again, it just was possible to give you that command. And uh, Thomas himself will say that everybody thinks that I'm modest. Everybody thinks that I'm self-effacing, and he was, but he says, you know, I'm not as modest as people think I am, and I didn't do it because I didn't refuse to take the command because I was too modest to take it. Uh, I do like this comment. Uh, again, it gives you some spirit, sense of his personality. I think one of the reasons that I like biography is I like trying to understand people and understand some of their personality, and I say with the way they tick. Um, I love this comment where he basically says that I'm not going to protest this situation anymore during the war. And in the future, he tells Halleck, if you want to put a stick over me, go right ahead and do so. I will take care to make sure that when I am responsible for my men, that they do what they're supposed to do and are not therefore involved in the mistakes of the, of the stick. So for people that think that Thomas doesn't have a temper, or that don't think that he has emotion or has this strong sense of, of self, um, of, you know, worth or self-confidence. Uh, he had it, he just, he just suppressed it in most circumstances. I say stubborn in defense and he'll prove that to be the case more often than not. A lot of people will say that Thomas was brilliant at defense, less so in offense. Uh, I don't think that, that you can say that that's true. Uh, Felix Zollinghoffer wouldn't say it was true. Uh, John Bell Hood wouldn't say it was true. Uh, there are others who would say that they might not agree with that assessment, but, uh, but certainly at Stones River, 
when Rosecrans gets in trouble, it's really George Thomas, who both at a council of war and in his own actions gives a, a, a sort of strong backbone to the, uh, to the Union cause. And I love two quotes that emerge. And again, I'll never forget when, uh, when I would say these quotes, somebody might say, well, do you have corroboration that he actually said these things? And he was in a room where he was saying it on one side of the room. If you weren't uh, there where you could hear it, you may not hear him say it. That doesn't mean he didn't say it. Uh, but it fits his personality. And one of those comments was that this army can't retreat. Uh, we just simply have to hold on where we are and, and make the best fight we can. And the best way to describe that is another quote, there's no better place to die than here. That was actually the quote somebody said, well, I don't know if he really said that, but that fits the circumstance and it fits his personality. Of course, at Chickamauga, he is also going to become, uh, he's going to excel at defense. Uh, that is where he will earn another nickname that is even more famous and, and attaches more to him. These are the opening uh, parts of that engagement. Uh, actually, uh, a comment was made about writing about Nathan Bedford Forrest. Forrest Cavalry will initiate the fighting at Chickamauga, and then uh, it'll be carried on from there. Uh, Thomas is way down on the Union right. Uh, we'll see an arrow here that points to where he was initially. And then uh, as the night comes on and he has to shift and Rosecrans wanted um, Thomas to be in the most critical position. If you think about the most critical position, if you're in a spot where the uh, Confederate forces are attempting to cut you off from your base of supplies, which in this case would be Chattanooga, Tennessee, then your uh, most endangered part of your force is on the Union left. And so through the night, uh, Thomas will move his men and reposition themselves, as you can see this arrow, in the direction toward the north, where he'll end up being uh, on the Union left. So he actually uh, repositions himself uh, as Rosecrans prefers for him to do. Rosecrans will take some criticism because one of the things that uh, some writers will say is that whenever Thomas called for support, Rosecrans tended to favor him and send that support to him, weakening other positions. But Rosecrans knew that the most critical position was on that Union left. And I think that's what he kept in mind the whole time. And so they see Thomas uh, again crossing uh, from uh, Union right to the Union left. And when he gets into that position, after uh, a second full day of fighting, uh, the Confederates will break through the center and the Union right will collapse. And only the holding of uh, Snodgrass Hill and Horseshoe Ridge by George Thomas and his men, plus some reinforcements that come at the critical moments, enable him to hold on to allow the remainder of the Federal forces to regroup. Um, there is, of course, a lot of question about the Confederates not uh, attacking in a more efficient and effective manner. Uh, circumstances always create a very difficult uh, situation on the field that's easy to assess after the fact. But the fog of war in terms of how a battle plays out or a campaign uh, or the entire war for that matter uh, has a sort of a life of its own. And, uh, and so Thomas will uh, hold on with his men on this very important defensive position with the idea that he has to um, he has to allow the Federals to regroup and to get themselves in a better position to hold Chattanooga. The image at the bottom is a famous painting. That is supposed to be, according to our friend Jim Ogden, uh, that's supposed to be Thomas's staff because they are mounted and he said there would be no cavalry around, so that would have to be Thomas's staff. One of the beefs that Sherman had with Thomas was that he thought he had too many, too much of a staff. And Thomas did like to have uh, as much of a uh, order and, and uh, opportunity in his command as possible. So he would have been very aware of every element from uh, commissary and, and uh, quartermaster to, uh, if you can think of uh, in terms of spies, uh, he was really good at that and gathering information and intelligence. Uh, logistics. I mean, almost every element, he would have someone there with responsibility 
that would answer to him and that he would depend on uh, as uh, his forces operated. And as they got bigger, those staff uh, responsibilities and the, and the staff themselves, the number would get bigger too. The famous nickname, of course, that emerged for Thomas Rock of Chickamauga. And these are a handful of the images that have been produced to try to illustrate that. Uh, at one point, as he sees uh, Rangers troops coming forward, he doesn't know if they're friendly or unfriendly. And uh, so he's trying to look and his horse is a little skittish and won't be steady. And so he hands his uh, looking glass to uh, someone who, whose horse is steadier, steadier than mine. Uh, Thomas was imperturbable on a battlefield. Uh, they said his horse was very much like its rider, its commander and was similar that way. And uh, again, steady and sturdy and dependable and reliable are all terms that you hear uh, applied to Thomas over and over again. Again, it's probably not a shock. A little older gentleman, so for him, his troops to favorably call him Old Pap. Old Pap. So he has a lot of nicknames. I'd say he probably has the most nicknames of any general in the war. Uh, but his nickname here from his stand at Chickamauga will be the Rock of Chickamauga. Again, notice the similar type of language when I said, you know, can, can you say that Thomas really said something like this? Well, he's certainly consistent. He will say uh, when the question is, should we try to work our way out, move our way out, march our way out, fight our way out, he says it will ruin the army to withdraw it now. We must hold this position and we must hold it until night. And that uh, I think reflects his, his mentality, his determination. Uh, and again, uh, he is gonna hold on until night when he can move off on his own terms. Uh, setting up positions, the intermediate positions between uh, Chickamauga and Chattanooga and then uh, joining the federal forces in Chattanooga itself. I have here a, an image of, um, of just a, another one of those images from the Park Service that talks about his, shows an old picture of him, and then a picture here of Emerson Opdyke. And uh, I think it really gives you a sense of how others saw him. He says, Thomas was serene. You know, he was confident, he was calm, he, he was uh, steady, and again, sturdy. Uh, he was serene amidst the storm, and he caused me to think of George Washington. A lot of people really did make that thought between what they expected or would have thought George Washington would have been like and what Thomas was like. And uh, as he noted, there were other officers who were not so calm and serene under the circumstances. And, uh, and Thomas just seemed to be almost matter of fact. He almost seemed to be unperturbed by what was happening around him. I do like this comment that's in the presidential papers and you can read it uh, in uh, the president's, uh, President Lincoln's papers when Lincoln is listening to or reading uh, descriptions of what people have to say about um, generals they consider to be weak or uh, incompetent or, or not uh, particularly effective. Uh, and they link George Thomas to some of those people. So if Don Carlos Buell is, is not considered one of the Union's finest, if William Rosecrans is not one of the finest, and of course Lincoln is supposed to have referred to uh, Rosecrans and, and uh, represented him in, a, in a, not a particularly positive light, uh, he doesn't have that opinion about Thomas. It's, Thomas is not like he's been hit on the head like a stunned duck. He says, I hasten to say that the state of information that we have here, what we know, nothing could be more ungracious than to indulge any suspicion, you might say further suspicion towards General Thomas. It is doubtful whether his heroism exhibited at um, Chickamauga has ever been surpassed in the world. Uh, that is certainly quite a, a, a pat on the back by a president who was at one point um, more interested in just, let's see how things play out. Let the Virginian wait. Uh, he's not waiting any longer. Of course, uh, Grant will come east to take over command in the Chattanooga area, and he will uh, bring uh, William T. Sherman over with him and rely heavily on Sherman. But in the meantime, he tells Thomas to hold 
the town and uh, Thomas promises we will hold it until we starve. Uh, the uh, army was under short rations and it gets worse as time goes on. That's in part the reason why Thomas will tell Grant when he arrives that uh, the army is not ready for an offensive operation. But one thing you can guarantee is that Rosecrans is on his way out. Now, this is one of my favorite little things on my PowerPoint. You have to watch that screen to the lower right. There's Rosecrans, and there he goes. He's bounced out. I love that. And there's the new man, uh, Grant. But in the meantime, until Grant gets there, uh, Thomas is, is, is asked to hold on, and he agrees that he will hold the town until we starve. When he arrives, there's a lot of feeling that Thomas and Grant, again, had this innate hostility toward each other. And I don't believe that that existed. Uh, it didn't exist at uh, Chattanooga when Grant first arrives, he arrives early. Uh, there's a lot of backstory that we don't have time for for this, but uh, he's not in the best condition himself. It's wet, uh, he's had a fall, uh, things are not looking good and Thomas, I think was not expecting his superior to show up and he wasn't prepared. There's nothing that Thomas did worse than when he wasn't prepared. If he was prepared, he could handle anything. When he wasn't prepared, sometimes he seemed like he almost had to figure it out before he could figure out what to do. And so there's a lot of stories about what uh, brings his uh, attention to Grant in the appropriate way, but uh, but they do talk and they do co collaborate, and Grant uh, and Sherm and uh, uh, Thomas does convince Grant that it's premature to try to strike at the Confederates just yet, and Grant decides, well, I can wait for Sherman to show up. He wages war the way I like anyway, and ultimately that's more or less what happens. Uh, one of the early successes in um, this camp part of the, the war is uh, the, the, Ch uh, the Chattanooga part is uh, at Orchard Knob where um, uh, Thomas's troops actually step off as if they're almost on field parade and they move out and capture an eminence out in front of Missionary Ridge. And then of course the subsequent attack up Missionary Ridge that Thomas's troops are going to be able to carry when Sherman's troops are not. Sherman's troops attempting to, to uh, attack on the, the flanking uh, part of the Confederate line are actually to run, gonna run into Patrick Claiborne and be stopped. And they're gonna run into geography too. Uh, two ridge lines that uh, Sherman does not fully understand and, and recognize. And then uh, Claiborne's defense. And it's, it's uh, Thomas's troops that carry the day. And there's quite a story to that as well of uh, what Thomas and Grant do to interact with each other as the troops are carrying the ridge. And I will say this just to shorten it all for our purposes tonight on their own authority, on their own accord. Uh, again, our friend Jim Ogden has done the best job of explaining it to me that there were Confederate positions at the base, but out from the ridge. And then there were Confederate positions on the top of the ridge and the Confederates had divided regiments so that part of the regiment would be on those front positions and part of them at the top. And so the combination of taking that first line and then still being under fire from the top, uh, the Federals decided not to stop and they pursued the uh, retreating Confederates back up uh, the ridge itself and, and ultimately overran the ridge. In the Atlanta campaign, and I actually unfortunately cut, cut off a picture. I was trying to move that quote around and I ended up cutting it off. So I apologize for that. But uh, Sherman's uh, wheel horse is uh, William, uh, excuse me, is George Thomas. And he makes the comment, he's my off wheel horse. He knows how to pull with me though we don't pull in the same way. And for those of you who don't know uh, artillery that well, if you look in the uh, Union artillery piece uh, in the bottom part of the screen, there's six horses. The two in the front are the lead pair, the two in the middle are the swing pair, and the two in the rear are the wheel pair. The off wheel horse is the one that would not be ridden. Thomas will have the largest of the three major armies that Sherman is going to maneuver in the Atlanta campaign toward Atlanta. But he's saying that Thomas is not going to be ridden, that he's my off wheel horse. And he's also going to say he knows how to pull, but we don't pull in the same way. And I think that's very insightful. Sherman and Grant really waged war very much the same. 
Thomas was a different bird. He was more methodical and a little more traditional in ways that uh, uh, kind of, I think, ro ra raised Grant's ire at times. Um, it'll be Thomas's troops who try to break through at Kennesaw Mountain. If you ever come to Kennesaw Mountain, we'll go to Cheatham Hill and you can see what happens there. Uh, Thomas's last major action in the war is to take on uh, John Bell Hood at Nashville, where he earns yet another nickname, the Sledge of Nashville. He's almost removed from command on a couple of occasions. Grant himself is on his way to remove Thomas when word comes of the attack that Thomas that Grant has been called for, calling for has been made. Thomas does not delay for any uh, impractical or foolish reason. He delays for eminently good reasons. One, to get his force in the best position possible, and two, because of the weather. The weather had been awful, and it was hard for uh, troops to even launch an attack, stand up, much less launch an attack. So Thomas is going to complain that, um, that you know, the authorities in Washington don't respect him, and yet, if they'll leave him alone, he'll win. And in the end, he will tell uh, General Wilson, James Harrison Wilson, dang it to hell, Wilson, didn't I tell you we could lick him? Didn't I tell you we could lick him? And that was one of his tells too. Another of his tells, when he was excited, he would stroke his beard up. And when he was calm, he would smooth his beard down. I think he was probably pretty uh, stroking it up uh, for this period of time. And he will get a promotion, but he will himself again show that edge because he says that promotion uh, that he thought that he had actually earned at Chickamauga was uh, not now actually bestowed to him until after Nashville. And he said, I suppose it's better late than never, but it's too late to be appreciated for me to appreciate it. I earned this earlier. Uh, there's Thomas at rest in his, um, in his, place at uh, Troy, New York, which of course was his wife's home place, and that's her family plot. Um, it uh, is a beautiful location if you ever happen to go that way. Before he was, though, at rest, I wanted to at least mention a couple things about his humor. Um, these are just quotes that I pulled out. You don't have to read them all, but down in the Alaska part, which is where I told you I would tell you the story, he says two things that I think are interesting. Number one, he says, if we'd have had Alaska before the war, we could have sent the hotheads there and they could have cooled off. And the other thing he says is that uh, he did a lot of moving and traveling, which he thought was pretty good for a slow man. Uh, that middle quote, I love that one, where he has a, an officer, uh, I mean, he has a soldier rather, who says, I haven't seen my wife in three months and I want to go home and see her. Can I have a furlough? And he says, well, I haven't seen mine in three and a half years. And the guy says, well, General, me and my old woman ain't them kind. And it supposedly set Thomas to, to uh, goofawing laughter, which was unusual for him. And, uh, and uh, he would tell that story and laugh uproariously. Again, for him, that was unusual. The Thomas temp temper, I'm really not going to again give each one of these the story, but, uh, but the bottom, next to the bottom one talks about uh, that comment to Wilson at Nashville, where he says, if they'll just leave me alone, it'll be fine. But the ones in the middle, again, I think are sh his personality, he just didn't want to give speeches at, uh, at the beginning of the war when people were giving speeches. Um, they, they were calling on him to give a speech, and he said he didn't usually say bad words. Damn, this time's about as bad as it gets for Thomas. Dang it was his preferred term, dang it to hell. But damn this speech making, I won't speak. What does a man want to make a speech for? And then he didn't like people that abused um, their soldiers or abused animals. And he will tell one, uh, one of his subordinates when he's not behaving as he expects him to behave, you can go home and you can go home by the next train. What you do to cattle might be one thing, but you're not going to feed my soldiers anymore. And, and he sends him packing. And then finally, the logic, the Thomas logic. I love these two quotes. I think they really give you a, a sense of his personality. Put a plank six inches wide, five feet above the ground, and a thousand men can walk it with no problem. You raise it 500 feet and only one of a thousand will walk it. It's a question of nerve that we have to solve, not one of dexterity. 
one of the subordinate officers, well, one of the officers who comes to be pretty important in his life later on in a negative way uh, is actually um, going to spend a lot of time criticizing Thomas and, and among other things says that he's not the person who had won the Nashville campaign. Um, and he talks to him, talks about him as if he's not very smart. Well, Thomas was pretty smart. And I think he turns the, the, uh, the, the tables on people that thought, thought that he wasn't. And his assessment of McClellan, look at what he's saying where he says his big problem was that he sent out uh, public statements all quiet on the Potomac as if somehow uh, when you're thinking about an opponent, uh, quiet is the best, the best solution you can have, the best choice you can have. And he says, what actually happened by that, those, under those circumstances was that the men began to have a greater concern and fear of an enemy that they could have been taught not to be so afraid of had McClellan approached it in a different way. I think that's, again, very insightful. At the end of the day, Thomas gets a lot of recognition. He has Thomas Circle in Washington. He has a, 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 a $5 bill that's gonna have his likeness on it. He has an official portrait in Nashville and a, a medallion cast. Uh, but uh, he thought history will do me justice and I'm not so sure that uh, it, it acted as quickly as, as he would hope that it would. Uh, I would like to think that my book did him justice. I think I got him and figured him out pretty well. I certainly tried to give him his due and hopefully maybe I was able to accomplish that for the general. So with that, let me end. Uh, there's a, a picture of course of uh, a, a uh, medal that was created for um, Thomas and the uh, Army of the Cumberland. He was very proud of the Army of the Cumberland and uh, you can see that as well. And there's a picture of me at Fort, what was then Fort Benning, looking at the museum uh, with uh, Thomas staring in one direction and me staring at the other. I do have a couple of books that uh, you might be interested in looking at. Maybe we can talk about that later. Uh, but my George Henry Thomas book, It's True as Steel, is available. And then finally, just let me say thank you so much for, for having me here. And I'll turn it back over if you guys can tell me what I need to do. <laughs> Let me stop sharing. I guess that was my choice. Uh, hang on one second. Let me do that. There we go. Well, thanks, Professor. All right. Thank you very, very much. Uh, well, thank I, you. We all enjoy it. That was terrific. Well, we have a we have a question for you here. Okay. All first, right. Fire first, away. First question is how did how did it come about that he got his image on the bills that he, that Congress uh, gave him a five dollar bill? Well, of course, you know. Uh, we look at the, the Civil War and we think about a couple of names as almost automatically. We think of Grant and we think of Sherman. Uh, but anyone who really studied the war and studies the Union war effort sees Thomas as, if not the third, maybe certainly in the top five of Union generals. At the time of the war and in, in the aftermath of it, I can guarantee that, that he was highly regarded as being certainly one of the top, again, three, if not if you want to put him below Sheridan or somebody, you could always do that. But, but I think that you, you, you'd put it uh, and you'd not get much argument from most people, Grant, uh, Sherman, and Thomas. How was, he, how was he assessed by the surviving Confederate generals after the war? What were their comments about him? It's kind of funny how the Confederates looked at him. There were a lot of Confederates who thought that he was really secretly loyal to the Confederacy and that he must have been forced into his uh, position by other uh, factors, most importantly and maybe significantly his wife, Frances Thomas. Uh, she was a Northerner and the idea was that somehow she must have uh, driven him to what he did. You know, and when the wife says the general would always know what he should do, you can imagine if you're married and your wife says you will always know what you should do, uh, there may be some influence there. There's no question. But Th Thomas really did look at, uh, at the old, his loyalty to the old army, his loyalty to the Constitution, his loyalty to the Union as being primary. You know, Lee looked at Virginia as being primary, uh, Jackson and, and Jeb Stewart. But Thomas, not so. He really did look at the Union as primary, and he thought secession was foolish. He thought that uh, the C Confederates were uh, really just setting themselves up for failure and that they should have had enough good sense to recognize that. 
And after the war, when there were flags still popping out periodically, he'd be the first to crack down on that saying, you folks didn't learn your lesson. You need to get with the program. He didn't put it that way, but that's what he meant. Uh, take the flags down. If you don't, I'll put a few of you in jail until you do. And <laughs> he was not afraid to get people's attention and, and, uh, and stand for the union uh, before and after. But again, a lot of people thought that, uh, especially Confederates thought two things. Number one, that he really was loyal to the Confederacy and his heart and had been misled. And two, that he was a traitor. I'll never forget when I was gonna do a talk in Southampton County, one of the native uh, members of the, the, of the county came up to me and says, why are you gonna do a talk on this traitor? And I said, well, you know, he might have looked at it a different way. And he might have looked at <laughs> he might have looked at it the the yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And how about Pemberton's wife? Was did she have an effect on him? Didn't he well, stay? You know, they can say there's there's examples on both sides of people who have influenced people in, in different ways. So uh, I'll leave it to say that if if a man is happily married and his wife has an influence him, I would not on him, I would not be shocked. So uh, we have a question about what he did after the war. It looks like he took assignment in the West and in Alaska. So tell us some little about that. Well, he, he was not there initially. He was initially in the South during Reconstruction and actually uh, a good part of that post-war period was there. Uh, but he won't live that long after the war and his last um, assignment was out in, uh, in the West Coast. He had been in the West before uh, so this wasn't new, but his posting was actually out of the Presidio in uh, San Francisco. So he was there, but then they wanted to try to do a, um, a wide ranging inspection tour. And remember, he was one of those people that preferred to do these things himself. And uh, so he wanted to check things out. And one of the things he was supposed to do was to look at this new purchase, Alaska. What have we got? What is there? And And I'll tell you, this shows you, now, Thomas, who was interested in science, he sent, uh, he sent specimens to the Smithsonian from the West. He was, he was a scientist, but he looked at Alaska and says, I don't see anything worth having up here. <laughs> and, that, and that was his, his feeling. He said, there's nothing worth having up here. And, uh, and he had some interesting talks with some of the Native Americans that he came into contact with, but uh, he says, there's nothing up here we really need or want. And uh, it's turned out, you know, between gold and oil, I think it's probably been all right. So. <laughs> someone, someone would like to know if he's remembered at West Point, if they have any uh, anything for him up there. You know, that's a really good question. I, I, I've been to West Point. Of course, I did research there as part of this, but years and years ago. Um, and I'm trying to remember if there's anything specific to Thomas, and it's just nothing come to my head uh, about that. Again, he just wasn't, though, he, he wasn't a self-promoter. I think that's part of his problem. You would like to think that a general doesn't have to be, but, uh, but, but Grant could get what Grant wanted, partly because Grant would push for it. I mean, Grant had that doggedness on the battlefield. But he had a doggedness in, in other places as well. Yeah. And uh, one reason that people think that Thomas and Grant didn't get along was because, um, you know, you have this sense that once Grant has taken a, a, a dim view of you, he never lets go. Well, Thomas and Grant really did not express that kind of feeling toward each other, even to the end of Thomas's life. And, Tom, and Grant couldn't have been nicer about uh, his remarks about Thomas after he had, when he passed. And, uh, and so, you know, it's really a later that Mrs. Thomas starts looking at Grant askance about, uh, about that. And then, and, and there are other things that help uh, stir that up. But I think Grant got impatient with, with Thomas. He wanted a person that behaved and, and fought what he did. And Thomas had a tendency to be too methodical too oriented to preparation. When a campaign was over, you tend to spend time getting ready for the next one. For, Sherm, for Grant and Sherman, it was, you keep going. And Grant, one, at one point, will actually have troops reassigned from Thomas and said, when he did not do what I wanted him to do, essentially, I depleted his army. And so uh, Grant didn't have a lot of patience with, with what he thought was waging war in a, in a different way that was not uh, the same as, as, as the way he thought it should be waged. And in that sense, I think you do have you know, a little bit of a falling out. And I think it actually comes from Chattanooga 
uh, before anything else. I don't think it's Ch uh, Shiloh. I think it's Chattanooga. Well, after Atlanta, when the army was split and Sherman took part of it and Thomas got the other part, it's That's alleged right. Thomas got the the less the less uh, proficient or the less uh, uh, the, the less skillful or something else of the army. Do you have a thought about that? Well, Sherman was a favorite, so Sherman's going to get the the um, better uh, attention. We'll say it that way. And um, and Thomas was looked at as not necessarily in a position where he needed to have the same type of resources because he's not uh, operating behind, you know, quote unquote enemy lines. He's not moving towards Savannah. He's moving into an area that's well held by the by the Federals. And the notion is, is that he's on his element anyway in defense because nobody questioned his capability for as a defender. Uh, and the other point I think with Thomas is he's also being given authority to bring some troops in. He's Andrew Jackson Smith's coming from, from out in the uh, West uh, Trans-Mississippi region, and he's going to come in, and there's some others uh, that are going to be there as well. And so, you know, again, the notion is that he'll, Thomas doesn't need as much, and he'll have enough, and he's in the best position to maximize his capabilities anyway. Okay. So Bob Tripp has contributed. There's a Thomas Hall on Buffalo Soldier Field at West Point. Oh, and has a well, rock good. of Chickamauga plaque in front of it. So, well, that's great. good. Very good. Uh, do we have any I more questions? I guess I went everywhere but that. I didn't see that. <laughs> any more questions out there? I don't see any. So, uh, a great. I spent too much of my time, I guess, at the library. <laughs> <laughs> you should get out on the field or whatever, the, <laughs> the, the Buffalo Soldier Field. Okay. Well, Professor, it was great to have you. Uh, everybody's, uh, everybody's chiming in about with great presentation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. And I hope we get to see each other again soon. And uh, like I said, I'm neighbors. I've got a place at Holden. So we'll you be down back there when, occasionally. You come back and do another presentation when we're live so we can all get together. I hope so. I hope we can do that. Okay, great. Bye, everyone. You got care. Thank you again for the invitation. All right. Bye. Wally, it's great to see you, buddy. Thank you. Thanks.